defense calls Kim Potter to the stand. Okay, Ms. Potter. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear under penalty of perjury that you will truthfully answer questions? I do. This case. I do, Your Honor. Please have a seat and please remove your mask. And Ms. Potter, I gave the rules for testifying, and you've been in the courtroom. Do you need to, or need to repeat them? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, state your full name and spell it. Kimberly, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y, Ann, A-N-N, -N, Potter, P-O-T-T-E-R. All right, counsel. Thank you, um, Ms. Potter, will you speak into the mic? Because both of your lawyers have a hard time hearing. Yes, there's just the next here. Okay. Um, you stated your full name. How old are you, ma'am? 49. And are you married? Yes. And is your husband in the courtroom? Yes, he is. And what's his name? Jeff Potter. And how long have you been married? Over 25 years. And uh, when did you first meet your husband? When I was 15. And you're in high school? Yes. And did you reunite much later? Yes, when I was in college. <clears throat> and uh, what does your husband do? He works for a health care system now. Is he a retired police officer also? Yes, he is. And where was he a police officer? Fridley, Minnesota. Was he also a member of a drug task force? Yes, he was. And um, with respect to your children, do you have children? Yes. And what are they, two boys? I have two boys. And what are their names? Uh, Nicholas and Samuel. And are they in the courtroom? No, they're not. And where is Nicholas? He's an active duty Marine. And where's that at? He's currently stationed in Florida. And your other son, where's he at? He's in college in North Dakota. And are they going to be home for the holidays? Yes, they will. Is your mother in the courtroom? Yes. And your sister? No, she's not. But is your brother in the courtroom? Yes, he is. And besides your brother and your mother, your father is deceased? Yes. And do you have any other siblings? I have another sister and a brother. And what are they, do you know what their ages are? Um, my sister, my oldest sister is in her 50s, and my other brother is in his 50s also. And what do they do for a living? My sister works for a medical device company. Uh, my oldest brother works for a parking company, and my other brother works for retail. Going back to when you were a youngster, uh, where did you go to elementary school? Immaculate Conception Catholic School. And where was that located or is located? Columbia Heights, Minnesota. And did you live in that neighborhood? Yes, I did. While you were at elementary school, while you were going to that school, did you uh, have a police officer visit your school? Yes. And do you actually know his name today? Yes, it's Officer Michael McGee. And where was he a police officer at? The Columbia Heights Police Department. And why was he at your school? He was doing bicycle safety for grade school kids. And you remembered his name. Anything else that was significant about him that caused you to do something in your life? He was, on that occasion, he really influenced me as a youngster, that the police are good people, and I wanted to be something like that someday. And because of that, and because of him being at your school, did you start out doing that? Yes. And what was your first job or volunteer work as a some type of a law enforcement officer, student, explorer, school cop? That well, the was? first thing I did was, I, in junior high, was a school patrol officer, if that counts. Yes, it does count. And what did a school patrol officer do back then? Uh, it was junior high, so we helped the younger uh, grade school age children get across the street. <clears throat> and did you continue to do that throughout junior high? Yes, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And after getting into high school, what did you do? Um, the Fridley Police Department came to my high school and had a booth set up for the Fridley Police Explorers. 
And did you did you join the Explorers? Yes, I did. Why did you join the Explorers? First of all, what is an Explorer? It's part of the Boy Scouts of uh, America. It's a area where you can have career enhancement, or you can learn about different jobs like law enforcement or uh, firefighting, things of that nature. And were you an explorer throughout your high school days? Yes, I was. I can't remember if I asked you what high school you went to. Uh, to Tino Grace High School in Fridley. <clears throat> with, with respect to criminal justice and law enforcement, while you were in high school, besides being an explorer, did you do anything else? I had jobs. Okay, what was your job? Uh, my first job was at a gas station. What did you do there? Uh, a clerk, cashier. And did you continue that job throughout high school? Yes, and into college. Okay, so your next visit was college. Yes. Where did you go to college? St. Mary's College in Winona, Minnesota. And um, that's about, what, 70 miles from here, 80? Yeah, it's down towards La Crosse. Okay, it's in Winona? Yes. <clears throat> and did you, what was your major at St. Mary's? Criminal justice and sociology with an emphasis on um, elderly studies or geriatric sociology. Why did you take those courses? I wanted to go into law enforcement and I had an interest in serving the older community and understanding their needs and wants. Did you graduate from St. Mary's? Yes, I did. And was that a three-year program, four and a four It years? was a four-year program. I finished it in three and a half because I had an internship in the summer. And where did you internship? Uh, the Columbia Heights Police Department. Columbia Heights Police Department? Yes. Okay. And what did you do at the Columbia Heights Police Department? I was assigned to an officer who was in their um, community-oriented policing uh, program. Were you also, did you also continue your explorer career while in college? Um, I stopped being an explorer after my freshman year, and then I role-played at the annual conference. What does that mean? Um, every year the Explorer Program had an annual conference at Breezy Point Resort, and they needed role players, and they liked to use students or people that were in law enforcement. So <clears throat> you're, you graduated from St. Mary's. Yes. And you, what did you do after that? After that, I would have gone to skills in the summer of 1994. Okay, and what do you mean by that? I went to skills. What, does, what does that mean? I went to the police certification program so and I could where, get hired. And where was that at? Alexandria Technical College. In Alexandria, Minnesota? Correct. So everybody knows about 120 miles, 30 Yes. Minutes. And did you stay there while you were being educated? Yes. How, what kind of a program was that? How long was it? It was 10 or 12 weeks. And what do you mean? Is that where you obtain your skills to, to apply for a, as a police officer? Yes, it was a hands-on training. I had the college education, the book knowledge, and then I went there for my skills program or my hands-on um, part from my, getting my license. After this uh, program, uh, did you go out and try and get a job in law enforcement? Yes, I did. And... Were you successful at first? Yes. Well, did you have a job at Anoka? Um, Anoka? Yeah, I worked at the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center because I graduated in January, or I'm sorry, in December. I couldn't go to skills until the next summer, so I had to get a, I got a job. All right, so, but you worked skills, you were, you, you were in Alexandria, correct? Yes. And the job you got was at Noka State Hospital? Yes. <clears throat> that was between your skills? Say that again. So slow I got hired there in February, and I worked for a year on a, a calendar year. Uh, but the Anoka City Police Department would allow their students to, um, or their employees, I'm sorry, to go to skills and still have a job on weekends or when they would get back before they got hired as a law enforcement officer. So at Anoka State Hospital, what did you do? I was a security officer. And uh, Anoka State Hospital is for, is basically a detox center now, is that right? No, it's, it had a detox, it had a countywide detox, and a 
a detox program. It also had drug and alcohol abuse rehabilitation and mental illness. And what did you do there? You're in security? Yes. Does that mean you had to deal with the folks that are staying there, the residents? Yes. And were you successful in that? Yes. After working there, where did you go next? Um, I left there and got hired at the City of Brooklyn Center. And what year were you hired at the Bro Brooklyn Center Police Department? 1995. And when were you sworn in? February the 27th. Of 1995? Correct. Who was that you're swearing? Uh, my mother and my father. So after you're sworn in, you started working as a Brooklyn Center police officer? Yes. And what year was that again? 1995. So that would be, my math, 26 years before you resigned? Is yes. Is that your statement? Yes. <clears throat> when you worked as a police officer at Brooklyn Center, throughout those 26 years. Did you remain a patrol officer all during that time? I did. And why was that? Why didn't you attempt to go up the ladder like the other officers we heard from? I liked my work. I enjoyed working with the community. I didn't want to be in an administrative role. But did you also, uh, even though you were a patrol officer, you did take part in other programs, for example, the FTO program, right? Yes, I did. And that's a field training? Yes, I was a field training officer for many years. How, how many years? Uh, I don't have uh, an exact number, 10 to 15. And we've learned in this, court, in this case what a field training officer does, but very briefly, what did you do? Um, I would get probationers in different um, stages of their training, either in their first phase, their second phase, their third phase, or their final phase. Um, usually the primary phase or the first phase and the final phase were always with the same FTO. And then other, F, uh, other FTOs would train the other two stages. And why did you continue, continue to do that for so many years? I felt that I had knowledge and mentorship that I could help young officers develop into somebody I would want to work with and my partners would want to work with. There were other programs that you volunteered for or joined while yes. you were a police officer, is that correct? Yes. And after you became a police officer, what was the first program that you joined or volunteered? I became an explorer advisor for our explorer post. And what's an explorer post? Is that the younger people that are? Yes, the program through the Boy Scouts of America. And in that program you teach them about policing, is that right? Yes. And after, after that Explorers program that you joined, what else did you do as a police officer? I was on the domestic abuse response team. I was also a crisis negotiator. Let's stop at the domestic, domestic abuse program. When did, how long were you on that? Approximately. 10, 12 years, maybe more, maybe less. And what did that program entail? Um, we would respond. So officers would go out on domestic abuse situations or domestic calls, and if there was a victim of a crime or an arrest made or not an arrest made, we would follow up the next day with the victims um, to see that they were getting the things they needed, like domestic advocates, um, walking them through, getting order for protections if they had questions, and then helping them and checking in with them through the court process. And did you enjoy doing that? Yes. Why? Sometimes there were great successes and sometimes there were very sad failures. There's another program that you're involved in, it was a hostage program? I was a crisis negotiator for the, uh, the parent um, umbrella of the EOU team, the Emergency Operations Unit. And what did you do in that? I was a crisis negotiator. What does that mean? Um, we would go out on barricaded subjects or we would go out with the, I guess the SWAT team would be the easiest way to describe it, on warrants. Um, we would respond to calls where there may be people in danger. And was your job to try and negotiate with the subject and get him to submit to being arrested? Yes, he or she. Was that your main job? No, I was always a patrol officer. No, I mean, as far as... A hostage negotiator, that's what you did? Yes, I was a crisis negotiator. <clears throat> and um, 
what other programs were you in? Um, I was on the Law Enforcement Memorial Association Honor Guard. And what is that? Um, it's so the parent is the Minnesota Law Enforcement Memorial Association. Um, they do a lot of work to help survivors and their families um, make their way through the process of getting benefits after their officer is killed in the line of duty. Um, I was on the Honor Guard. What did you do being on the Honor Guard? When I started in 1998, I was on the colors team for approximately a year or two, and then I went to the uh, casket team. Well, what's the color team? The color team carries flags. And the casket team? We would carry the casket or the urn of the fallen officer and then fold their uh, flag. And would you be in contact also with the victim or the deceased family? Sometimes with the family, a lot of times with the chief of police because I would have to hand the hand. I would and have to give the folded flag to the police chief. And this was throughout the state of Minnesota? Yes. And these were police officers killed in the line of duty? Yes. Or other law enforcement officers? Most of, 99% uh, of it would be killed in the line of duty or we would do some retiree funerals. Any other programs you're involved in? I did a lot of crime prevention work for our police department and other presentations. Crime prevention presentations? Yes. What were those? Um, I was assigned an apartment complex in the city, and I would meet with management, and we would um, do some programming for their residents as far as personal safety, locking your car doors, taking valuables out of your cars, just regular safety in an apartment complex. And then I would do um, some other um, presentations on robbery prevention for banks in the city. By the way, when you were doing the... Um carrying caskets for that in that program. Were you aware of uh, office, officers that were killed in the line of duty by making a traffic stop? Yes, Sean Patrick from Mendota Heights. Objection, Your Honor. Move to strike. The objection is overruled. I'll let the answer stand. During your 26 years as a police officer, did you ever receive any complaints for abusing your power no. Did you ever receive any complaints from the public? No. In training, did you attend all the training sessions required by the Brooklyn Center Police Department while you were there? Yes. And with respect to uh, gun training, laser training, you, you attended all those too, right? Yes, I did. And did you pay attention? Yes, I did. With respect to that, in your approximation, and I'm not asking for exact numbers, but with respect to the training, what would you say the amount of training was for for the firearm, for the gun, and the amount of training for the laser? What would be the percentages there? For the firearms, uh, it would be probably 80%. We spent a lot more time on firearms than we did on taser. And tasers didn't come into the beam until years after your law enforcement officer, right? Yes, I believe trainers in this courtroom had said 2002 or 2003. And you started as a law enforcement officer, what year? 1995. With respect to laser, tasers, I say lasers, with respect to tasers, there's been evidence in the case that you had a Taser 7, is that correct? Yes. And the evidence in that was that the Taser 7 had it was shaped like a gun, fair statement? Yes. And the Taser 7 had a dark black, or at least a dark handle, and a dark top. Objection. Do you remember that? Objection. I'm trying. The objection is overruled. You may answer. Yes. The, the Taser that you received, was it approximately a month before... Uh, April 11th that you received this taser, do you remember? In the courtroom I was told I received it on March the 26th. Okay, and um, also let's, while we're there, with respect to these tasers and testing them, uh, the rule that we read said should test the electronics every day. 
that mm -hmm. right? Yes. And there is testimony that you didn't test yours a couple of days. Is that right? Yes, that's what I was told. And uh, do you agree with that, that you didn't test it? I don't recall if I would have or wouldn't have. And was that an important feature for law enforcement officers with new tasers? No. That n never used them since they had them? Correct. And while we're there, did you ever use a taser, use it by actually shooting it in all of your years' career as a law enforcement officer? I would take my taser out on rare occasions, but I don't believe I ever deployed it. Okay, when you take your taser out, it's to de-escalate what is going on. Is that a fair statement? Sometimes, or to prepare for what might be behind a door. Sometimes an officer has a gun, and sometimes an officer has a taser out. All right. And now the taser that was switched from you, did that go to one of your partners, that taser? My old taser? Yes. Um, I believe they were just put in storage at the police department. And those tasers were all yellow, right? The yeah. handle, the top, the whole thing was yellow. Yes, That's except it. for the battery pack. I believe that was black, and there was some okay. markings on the side. I'm going to show you these tasers. Show you this taser. Yes. All right, the objection is sustained. Okay, well, <clears throat> do you specifically remember your old taser? By that I mean the one before the seven uh, being all yellow? Yes. And um, was that an X26 taser? I believe it was an X26P. P? So... With respect to the tasers, there's been evidence about signing some forms on warnings. Do you remember signing those forms? In our annual training, we would be handed a form to sign, and I would sign it. And do you remember the warnings on them at all? Not from those days, no. And with respect to weapons confusion, was there ever any training, actual training, 
about weapons confusion as you remember it? No. Did you even know what weapons confusion was before? Yeah. Wait till I finish the question. Before April 11? It would be mentioned in training, but it wasn't something we physically trained on. And by that, you mean what? There was no training on weapons confusion. You wouldn't be set in a dark room and told to grab which weapon. So, I'm going to go now to April 11th, 2021, a Sunday. And uh, you surely remember that day. Is that correct? Yes. And... You were an FTO that day for Officer Lucky? Yes, I was. And that day, what time did you go on duty? 6 a.m. And was Lucky on duty at that time, too? Yes. At about, what did you do during the morning? If you remember, did you just, just do drive around peace, police work? We just did police work. He would, we would have checked a squad car if we wouldn't have had calls right away. It was a Sunday. It was a Sunday. So approximately around 2 o'clock, um, did you pull up in back of, or not you, Officer Lucky was driving the car, right, the squad? Yes. And you were the uh, FTO. Where were you seated in the car? In the passenger seat. And tell the jury what you remember about first seeing the white Buick on that day, approximately 2 p.m., and talk I would, slowly. Officer Lucky and I were driving south on Zane Avenue North. We were talking about pursuit policies, um, doing some regular FTO training, and he observed a vehicle in the turn lane with a blinker on inappropriately. And was that the white Buick? Yes. And did you have a conversation with him about that? Yes. And... What was that conversation? Uh, we discussed a little bit of suspicious activity. Um, he noticed a, a pine tree or a air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror, and the, the tabs were expired. And uh, did he want? Did you stop that vehicle? Officer Lucky wanted to stop the vehicle. Yes. And let me ask you, a, sort of a hypothetical: If you had been working alone that day. On Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, would you have stopped the vehicle for? I can't even finish the question, Your Honor. All right. That's not fair. The it's simply no. They know how to try a lawsuit. Okay. I would think. The objection is overruled. You may answer. My question was: If you weren't with a field training officer that day, and you were on patrol alone, would you have stopped that vehicle? Most likely not. And why not? An air freshener to me is not, it's just an equipment violation. And during the COVID times, uh, the high COVID times, um, the Department of Motor Vehicles was so offline that people weren't getting tabs and we were advised not to try to enforce a lot of those things because the tabs were just not in circulation. Okay. But you, you did stop the vehicle, right? Yes, part of field training is that my probationer would make numerous contacts with the public throughout the day. And um, what happened after the stop? If you remember, uh, you've... go ahead. Before Officer Lucky stopped the car, where he ran the vehicle, uh, confirmed that the registration was expired and that the registered owner had a petty misdemeanor type warrant for some type of drug offense. And that was the registered owner of the vehicle? Yes. <clears throat> so after you, and you did that while you were still in a squad car and not? Yes, it's part of the multitasking that a probationer will have to do is run a vehicle license plate, call into dispatch, and initiate their lights. Okay, and one, try and talk a little slower. I know you're probably nervous, but I'd like to get all this in. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, so you stop the vehicle, is that right? Officer Lucky initiates the traffic stop. And what happened after he did that? Um, the vehicle stopped kind of in an entrance to the church on 63rd, and he got on the PA and told the vehicle to pull ahead just a short distance. 
Was that because he was parked in the driveway of the? Yeah, and I think there was a vehicle trying to come out, as I recall. Okay. What happened next? Officer Lucky and I exited our marked squad car. Um, Officer Lucky walked up to the driver's door, and I stood at the right rear corner of the white Buick. So you did get out of the car? Most definitely. And why did you stand where you were standing? Part of it was so I could see where Officer Lucky was um, and to provide cover to see what else was in the vehicle. In your experience of 26 years and being a patrol officer all those years, is stopping any vehicle at any time that you don't know, does that be considered a dangerous situation? Yes. Why? Sometimes there's guns in the car, sometimes there's uncooperative people. You don't know who you're stopping. Yeah, because you don't know, right? Right. So, while you were standing there um, in the rear of the vehicle, did you hear what Officer Lucky said? I could hear parts of the conversation. Um, he didn't seem to be in any distress when he was asking questions. He took out his notepad um, and it looked like he was writing down something which would end up being a name and a date of birth. Okay, and after he did that, did you two go back to the squad car? Yes. And at some point in time during the stop or right after it, um, did Officer Lucky do anything with in connection with obtaining another squad car? Yes, he called for a second car to come. What uh, is that about? What? Uh, it would just be a backup officer. The registered owner had a, a warrant of some nature. It wasn't a, a, a bad warrant. It was just a regular petty warrant. Um, which would still, you'd want a second officer. Or I guess in this case, a third officer. Officer Lucky and I are considered only one officer. And why, is, why are you and Lucky just one officer? Because he's in field training and he's a probationary employee. All right. So did the third officer, Officer Johnson, arrive at some point in time? Yes, Sergeant Johnson arrived. And um, was that before you looked up in the computer about this uh, driver of the vehicle? Or be after? I, I don't know exactly when he arrived. I know Officer Lucky and I were doing, uh, or Officer Lucky and I were discussing running um, the name he was given through some various systems. Okay, and did you do that, you and Officer Lucky? Yes. Was there any um, correction that you told him about during this time that he shouldn't have put the name in one? He had gone to the Minnesota, because the, red, the driver didn't provide him with any government-issued ID, he would have had to verify some information to run him properly in our system through TriTech. Um, so you run them sometimes through Minnesota DVS uh, with just a, a name and a date of birth. It'll give you a sound X hit on various people with that same, either same name or common name with a date of birth. So did you correct him on that? We were talking about, I don't know if I corrected him on it, but... So what happened after that? Um, he would copy the OLN, which is a driver's license number, um, off the screen and then put it into our tri our TriTech system or CAD and that would run him through the state for driver's license and warrants and other hits. And did you f uh, find anything about the driver? The driver came back with a suspended driver's license, a gross misdemeanor, bench warrant for weapons and a protection order. So a gross misdemeanor for weapons ordinance, what went through your mind, if anything, when you read that? It would be concerning that there'd be a weapon on the person or in the vehicle. And why would that be? In my experience over 26 years, I have found guns in cars, either by accident or by them just being sitting out in plain view. And what about a person with a weapons warrant? They're, They're more likely to be carrying a weapon or have a weapon access to them. So. Um, what about the temporary, was it a temporary restraining order that came up? Was that it? Or, uh, so? yeah, I think they're called ex parte orders. It would be a temporary protection order until the parties would either have a court hearing uh, in front of a judge to make it a permanent order. And there would be a name of a female on that? Yes, order? there was. And was there a female in the Buick or in the automobile that was stopped? Yeah, in the front, yes, in the front passenger seat. So after you learned that, did you also learn something? Did Officer Lucky tell you something about drugs or marijuana? 
He came. He when he initially got back to the car, he told me there was a, a obvious smell of marijuana and some <coughs> seedlings or shake uh, residue on the center console and inside the vehicle. Okay. So with all of that information, what did you do next? Uh, we told Officer Lucky explained to Sergeant Johnson what was going on. Um, I corrected. Where was Sergeant Johnson? Was he in your squad car? He was standing at my passenger door. Go ahead. And uh, Officer Lucky was explaining to Sergeant Johnson what was happening and what we need, what he wanted to do. Um, Officer Lucky only told Sergeant Johnson that he had a warrant, and I told Officer Lucky that he needed to tell Sergeant Johnson what the warrant was for. Um, a weapons violation warrant would be cause for care and, and concern. All right. And after that conversation, what happened, if anything, next? We got out of the vehicle. Sergeant Johnson was going to the passenger side. And oh, excuse me. Uh, Don't me interrupt you. What was, back up a little. I'm getting ahead of me. What was the plan when you got out of your vehicle with Lucky and Johnson was outside? What was your plan? The plan was for Officer Lucky to get the driver into custody for the warrant, and we'd further investigate with the female who she was and if she was the petitioner or the subject of the restraining order. Were you required by policy and law in learning about that warrant to arrest the driver of that car? Yes, it was an order of the court. And with respect to the restraining order or whatever you called it, um, did proper police procedure that you knew of for 26 years required to find out who that lady was? Yes. And why would that be? It's my duty to find out who she is to make sure she's not in harm's way. Um, there's been times when that hasn't happened and somebody has ended up um, killed because that wasn't followed. So now we're at the Buick. It's a Buick car, white car. It's a right? white car. And now we're at the white car and you three went up to it, correct? Yes, yeah, Sergeant Johnson where, went to the where passenger did Johnson side. Go? He went up the passenger side to provide cover. And what does provide cover mean? Keep an eye on the occupants of the vehicle um, and just to monitor what's happening outside in the world. See if and people are walking up on you or things go wrong. And where were you located? I was towards the left rear corner of the car. And where was Officer Lucky? He was advancing <clears throat> to the driver's door. And how, by the way, before this, how long had you known Officer Lucky? I think we were on our fifth shift. And he was pretty new arrival, was he? Or? I believe he was in second phase, maybe. But he had been a police officer before. Okay, what does second phase mean? Um, he wasn't in his initial four weeks. He was in the start of his second four weeks. Yeah, and you testified, you knew at least back then, that he had come from another police department, correct? Yes, I think he worked at two previous agencies, and he was an explorer. Okay. Now let's go back to when you three arrived at the white car. Um, we've already said where you're located. Officer Lucky was at the driver's door, is that right? Yes, he would have been standing behind the post between the driver's door and the, pas the rear passenger door. What do you mean by that, standing behind the post? He wouldn't have been directly in front of the door because that would be an unsafe approach. And it, this was a, was this a warm day? Was a window down? Remember? I don't know if the window was down or not. Okay. But in any event, where were you standing again? At the left rear corner. And uh, did you hear what Officer Lucky said? Yes, I heard him ask the driver to step out of the vehicle a couple of times. And um, did the driver step out of the vehicle finally? Finally, he asked Officer Lucky a couple of times what was going on, and Officer Lucky said he would explain to him. When he got out of the car? Yes. And so did the driver get out of the car? Yes. And what do you remember happening next? Officer Lucky had him turn around, and I think he was still asking what was going on. Um, Sergeant Who's he? John Who's he? Um, the driver. Go ahead. And Sergeant Johnson and... Um, Lucky told him he was under arrest, and I told him he had a warrant. Okay, so who said he was under arrest first? Uh, Sergeant Remember? Johnson, I believe. And 
Sergeant Johnson testified here. You remember that? Yes. And after he said that, did Officer Lucky say he's under arrest too? Yes. And you heard that? Yes. And uh, what did you say then? I told him he had a gross mis or I told him he had a warrant. You just said warrant? I think so. Did you specify what kind of warrant, if you remember, if you don't? I don't think I would have. It wouldn't have been in my normal. Okay, so what happened after Johnson and Lucky said you're going to be handcuffed or you're under arrest, and you said yes. that there was a warrant? What happened next? Uh, Officer Lucky hadn't put his hands behind his back, and I noticed that in uh, the driver's right hand was some type was something it was paper or something um, and I took it out of his hand and had it in my left hand and you had that in your left hand yes and then what happened next why did you strike that uh, when you did that I take it you got closer to the uh, driver yes I reached into the driver's hand and, and took out what he had in his right hand when had right it in hand my, or left hand his his right hand and I held it in my left hand okay and what happened next? Uh, Officer Lucky started to say something about don't do that, don't tense up, stop doing that. And then it just went chaotic. What do you remember happening after that? I remember a struggle with Officer Lucky and the driver at the door. Um, the driver was trying to get back into the car. Uh, well, he was trying to get back in the car. What did you do? I went around Officer Lucky as they're trying to get back in the door. I'm between the door and Officer Lucky and and the driver. And the driver's getting into the car. And what happened next? They're still struggling, and I can see Sergeant Johnson and the driver struggling over the the gear shift because I can see Johnson's hand and then I can see his face and you you knew Johnson for many years before this is that right yes and by looking at his face at that point in time what did you interpret it to mean he had a look of fear on his face it's nothing I'd seen before Did you say anything when you saw this? What did you do? We were struggling. We were trying to keep him from driving away. It just, it just went chaotic. I, it. And then I remember yelling, "Taser! Taser! Taser!" And nothing happened. And then he told me I shot him. <laughs> Can you proceed or do you? Yes, it's fine. Okay. After the driver said you shot him, do you remember what you said, or do you, if you don't remember, did you look at the video and see what you said? Or do you actually remember what you said, I guess is my question, not with help from the video? I don't remember what I said. And what do you remember next, if anything? Uh, I rem they had an ambulance for me, and I, I don't know why. And then I went. Then I was at the station. I don't remember a lot of things afterwards. Do you remember saying something about prison? No. If you did say that, do you have any idea now why you would say that? No. Was the climate back then about police officers a little rough? Objection, Your Honor. The objection is sustained. All right. 
You don't remember saying it? No. And you don't know why I said it? No. Do you, did you, do you remember the response that our Sergeant Johnson or Major Johnson gave you? No. And when next do you remember what happened, if anything, if you remember? I remember getting an ambulance and then I was at the station. Okay. And you remember being in the ambulance arriving at the station? No. You don't remember the no. station? I remember getting to the station. Once you got to the station, do you remember what happened next? Um, the next thing I remember is Officer Fricky was in the room with me. And where were you located? Do you remember that? Uh, in the front office. Okay. In the front office room, do you remember? Were you sitting down, standing up? I, w I was on the floor. And after that, at some point in time, did your husband show up? Yes. At what time do you believe, from back there, April 11th, at what time do you believe that your memory came back to you? Probably uh, when my husband got there. So, so much of it is missing. <clears throat> After that night, um, and for the last few months, have you uh, been in therapy? Yes. And um, did you, you still work as a police officer there? No. Did you quit? I did. And this was your career? Yes. And when did you quit? A day or two after the incident. And um, why did you quit? There was so much Bad things happening. I didn't want my coworkers, and I didn't want anything bad to happen to the city. And did you own a home in Anoka or Hennepin County at the time? Yes. You, you and your husband. Excuse me. The objection is relevant. The objection is overruled. Did you own a home, your family home, for years past? Yes. And uh, did you sell it? Eventually. Before you sold it, did you move out of the state? Yes. And do you now live out of state? Yes. We have a moment, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. I'm done, Your Honor. Ms. Cross. Police officer, we're a police officer for 26 years. Isn't yes. That right? You said you started in 1995? Yes. And that was with the Brooklyn Center Police Department for that entire career, right? Yes. And you said that you resigned from the Brooklyn Center Police Department, right? Yes. And that was on April 12th of this year, right? Uh, yeah, within a day or two of the incident. Right after you had shot and killed Dante, right? Yes. And throughout that time period, you were a licensed peace officer, right? Yes. And to become licensed, you had to go through a number of requirements. Fair? Yes. You um, had a college degree. Excuse me, Your Honor, the, the uh, prosecutor speaking of that might do. Sure. Thank you. 
you have a college degree, right? Yes. And you also had to complete the the peace officer education program. That's that skills component that you talked about. Yes. And that included the skill sets and classroom training as well. Yes. You had to pass an exam to become an officer. Yes. And then you did all that before you started with the Brooklyn Center Police Department in '95, right? Yes. And then you got your license. Um, through the, the post board, correct? Yes. And and that stands for Peace Officer Standards and Training. Yes. Um, so you were licensed throughout that whole 26-year career, right? Yes. And you maintained all of the requirements to keep your license? Yes. Including all the training that was required for it as well, right? Yes. And... That training that's required for your license has all different kinds of components, true? Yes. You have things like use of force, use of firearms, tasers, all kinds of things. Yes. And you did, you did all that training? Yes. And you did all that every year throughout that 26-year period, right? Yes. Sometimes multiple times a year, right? Yes. And... All of those requirements were in place to make sure that you continued, were at the beginning of your career, and continued to be you know, competent and capable of performing the requirements of the job, right? Yes. You mentioned on direct that you were also a hostage negotiator as part of your duties, right? <laughs> Crisis negotiator. Crisis negotiator. Uh, did that involve some hostage-type situations? I've never had a hostage situation. Okay, but crisis negotiation. Yes. And that involved um, some de-escalation tactics, I presume, correct? Yes. And you had to develop that skill set and be pretty good at, at de-escalating situations as a, as a crisis negotiator, fair? Yes. Uh, so you had some experience in stressful situations doing that? Mm, no. So you were a crisis negotiator but never experienced a stressful situation? We talked to people. Talked to people in crisis. Yes. And part of your job as a police officer is dealing with people on their worst days, right? Yes. People who don't want to cooperate with you sometimes, right? Most of the people we talk to in crisis are either barricaded behind a door or talking to you from another room. Okay. For 26 years, you were a patrol officer, right? Yes. So you saw people out on the street every day as part of your job duties. Fair. Yes. And you um, talked about doing a lot of traffic stops during that career, correct? I did some traffic stops. Okay. Well, in some of those cases, uh, there are people who have weapons, right? Yes. Sometimes people want to flee, right? Yes. Sometimes people are violent. Yes. And all of that's part of being a police officer, dealing with people in those situations, right? Yes. Um, you'd agree that you're bound by policy and um, uh, the requirements of the job that Brooklyn Center, the police department, sets for you, right? Yes. And you heard Commander Fleslin testify, but yet you have to acknowledge those policies and essentially agree to abide by them every year you were an officer, fair? Yes. And you'd agree that um, your fundamental duty as a police officer is to safeguard life, right? Yes. Um, and you also have the duty to never employ unnecessary force. True? Yes. Part of the policy uh, also includes some of your responsibilities as an officer, right? Yes. And that includes being alert and attentive and capable of performing your job, right? Yes. And getting back to the training and sort of the post requirements, there's a lot of training that goes into being a police officer, fair? Yes. Um, and we talked about a couple of those things, but one of those subjects is use of force, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that a yes? Yes. And use of force can include things like restraints, handcuffs, defensive tactics, chemical irritants using batons, tasers, less lethal um, 
weapons and, and firearms as well, right? All those things are options available to you. True? Not all of them. Okay, well, you carry a whole number of things on your duty belt every day, right? Yes. And that includes a firearm and a taser, right? Yes. And you also had other items on that duty belt as well, correct? Yes. And as part of the training that you went through every year, they cover topics of all kinds of uses of force, right? Yes. Um, including the things on your duty belt and maybe other options that the department could use additionally, true? Only the things I was assigned on my duty belt. Okay. But in any case, that use of force training was a pretty key component of, of being an officer, right? Yes. Um, you were trained about when you could use force, how much force to use, um, and what would be appropriate force. Fair? Fair. And not only were you trained on that, but you had a lot of policy that... Uh, that dictated what you could and could not do in a particular situation, right? Yes. Um, and you were also trained on, on the readiness aspects of use of force, right? Being ready to engage whatever force might be required, right? Yes. Uh, including uh, making decisions under stress, right? What do you mean? Well, you had a lot of scenario-based training, right? Yes. And in those situations, those, um, those scenarios were set up to be as close as they could be to real life, right? I suppose. So you would be trained to have to make decisions in the moment about what to do and what force to use, right? Well, well it was a training situation, so it was usually slow and meticulous and controlled. Well, you did this year after year, right, for the entirety of your career, correct? I think scenario-based training started later, probably the last 10 or 15 years. Sure. But use of force training has been around for a long time, right? Yes. Because since you started as a police officer, you have, in some cases, had to use force. True? Yes. And there are limitations on how and when to use that force, right? Yes. So you've had training on that throughout your entire career, right? Yes. And... As part of that process, uh, the way that it's required for you to maintain your license is that you sign in and you sign off on um, attendance forms, and you basically, you, you have to be there, right? You can't not be there, right? Right. Um, and every year you have a certain number of training hours that are required, right? Yes. And you said on direct that you participated and you were paying attention during all those trainings, true? Yes. And um, some of those trainings had classroom instruction, PowerPoints, things like that, right? Yes. Some of them also included reviewing policies and other documents, right? Yes. And then there was also the hands-on training with the practical components, things like using drawing, um, drawing weapons, Things like that, right? Yes. And over the course of your career, you completed many, many, many hours of training, right? Yes. Um, and in terms of credit hours, we're talking somewhere in the ballpark of 1,700 credit hours. Does that sound right? I don't know the number of hours, but if that's what you have, that would be probably right. No reason to dispute that your training hours would have been in the thousands of hours over that 26-year career, right? Yes. Um, you indicated that uh, there weren't tasers uh, available when you first started at Brooklyn Center, true? No, they came in the early 2000s. Okay. But in 1996, you had um, a firearm, right? In 1995, yes. Sorry, 95, and then you were sworn in in 96, right? No, I was sworn in February 27, 1995. Okay. So in 95, when you first started, you, you had a firearm available to you. Yes. And you were trained to use that firearm. Yes. Trained how to handle it, right? Yes. Trained how to load it and unload it. Yes. Trained how to draw it. Yes. Right? And fire it. And how to safely handle it. Yes? Yes. Um... 
And that included when not to fire it, right? I suppose. And that training started at the beginning of your career, you said, in 95, but continued every year up until the time you resigned, right? Yes. Now, you indicated that tasers came later, but you were first trained on using a taser in 2002, correct? If that's what the documents say, I'm not sure when they came out. And if the documents say you were trained in 2002, you then would have been trained every year thereafter, right? Yes. And you started carrying a taser on your duty belt regularly as of 2005, right? Yes. Um, but at a minimum, in addition to all the other training you had, you would have had taser training year after year um, for at least the last 19 years, right? Yes. And the taser training that's required, um, and you saw the documents that were in court, also uh, requires not only review of, it requires review of policy, right? The taser policy, right? Yes. Uh, and it also requires um, practicing those reaction side draws, correct? Sometimes. All right, if we could put up exhibit 334, please, the last page. I'm going to put on the screen what's already been admitted as Exhibit 334. And we're going to scroll down to the very last page um, and highlight the uh, subsection C, please. So as part of the TASER policy includes that all training should include performing reaction hand draws or cross draws to reduce the possibility of accidentally drawing and firing a firearm. That's part of the policy, right? That's what it says. And that's part of what you're trained to do, correct? We didn't always draw from our, we aren't always drawing our tasers from our holsters. A lot of times we were in plain clothes during training. Okay. Well, your policy that you're required to abide by, that you signed off on, requires that you perform reaction hand draws, true? During the training, yes. It also includes the reason for that, right? Yes. And that's so that you reduce the possibility of accidentally drawing and firing a firearm, right? Yes. And we can take that down. Part of the reason for that is uh, weapons confusion, right? Yes. And that was known in the field and has been known for a number of years. True? I guess. Well, you were trained on it, right? We talked about it. It was part of your PowerPoints, correct? Yes. You were made aware during PowerPoint after PowerPoint after PowerPoint that drawing and firing the wrong weapon can happen, right? We were told it wasn't something that they expounded on. You were told that. Yes. And you signed documentation every year you were certified acknowledging that you knew the risks, received and reviewed the materials required for you to carry that taser, correct? Yes, I signed the document. Okay. Um, now, in terms of the carrying of these weapons, um, reaction side means what for you? That would be my left hand. Okay. You're right-handed? Yes. So carrying a taser, um, you have done for years on your left side, correct? Yes. And your firearm you carry where? On my right side. How many years have you carried your firearm and your taser that way? My firearm for 26 years and I and my taser according to your documents for 19. So as long as you've had that taser, you've carried it on your left side, correct? Uh, in the beginning, I carried it on my right side in a drop holster. And when did you switch? When we were given new holsters. And when would that have been? I don't know. Okay. But far before 2016, you saw the images that were up in court. Long before that, you were carrying your taser on your left side, correct? Yes. Years and years, right? Yes. We talked a little bit about reality or scenario-based training. When you go through those trainings, you have available to you all the options that would be on your duty belt, right? Although inert for the purposes of training, right? Yes. 
And the purpose of that training is to try to recreate real-life stressful situations as best as possible to practice making those types of decisions in the moment. Fair? Fair. Let's talk a little bit about your taser. Um, you'd agree that the taser 7 that you have and the taser you had before that um, has a safety mechanism on the side of it, right? Yes. And you have to flip it up to arm the taser? Yes. And when the taser is on and armed, um, it beeps, right? I don't know if it beeps. There's a display screen that turns on? Yes. And then there are two lasers with the taser 7 that appear on your target, right? Yes. A green one for the top probe, right? I believe so. It was a new taser. And a red one for the bottom? I would guess so, yes. Well, you were trained on it, right? Yes, but it was a while back. Well, you were trained in March of this year on that taser, correct? Yes. And you have to successfully operate and handle that taser in order to be certified to use it, correct? Yes. And you went through that hands-on process of turning on that taser and safely handling that taser in order to be certified, correct? Yes, in March. In March. And before that, you had had an X26P, correct? Yes. And that taser also had a laser and a safety and things like that, right? Yes. The screen that turned on. Yes. And the taser, and that was the taser that you had been carrying for years before, right? Yes. Very similar to the Taser 7 in that way. Similar but different. All right, so I'm going to put on the screen um, next to each other, please, Exhibits 210 and Exhibit 212. This is a picture, side-by-side -side pictures of you on April 11th, correct? Yes. And um, your taser is pictured on the left side of your duty belt, correct? Yes. And that's the way you've been carrying it for years and years, correct? Yes. And your firearm you carried on the right side of your duty belt, right? Yes. And you'd agree that the standard procedure for a reaction side, left hand draw for your taser in this case, would be to draw that weapon with your left hand, correct? Yes. All right, you can take that down. You were asked some questions on direct about uh, spark testing, the function test um, of the taser. The policy says that you should do that before the beginning of every shift, right? Yes. And you didn't do it the last two shifts that you worked, correct? That's what the documents say. Right. You didn't do one uh, for the last four of your last ten shifts that you worked, in fact, correct? If that's what the documents say. Which dates? You didn't do it on March 27th, correct? I guess. You didn't do it on March 28th. You're going to object to this cross-examination if she doesn't know all right. Okay. okay, one word objections, please. Um, if she doesn't know, she can say she doesn't know. The documents show that you didn't do a spark test for your last 10 shifts. You have no reason to dispute that, right? No. And the day of this incident on April 11th, you didn't do a spark test that day, right? No. According to the documents. And even though... Yeah, that day was a slow and uneventful day at the beginning of the day, right? I don't know. I don't have a log. Well, you told Dr. Miller that that day started as a slow and uneventful Sunday, right? I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know if I did or not. Have some side
Okay, you may continue. All right, so April 11th started as a slow and uneventful day, right? I guess it's a Sunday. Okay. I'm going to put on the screen exhibits 224 and exhibit 178 next to each other, please. All right, Ms. Potter, on the screen are exhibits 224 and 178. Um, You'd agree that these are photos of your taser and your firearm, respectively, yes? My firearm, for sure. I'm not sure if that's the taser that was taken that day, but I'm guessing it is. And you carried a taser 7 that day, correct? Yes. And that's what's in this picture, Exhibit 224? Yes. Um, now, these items look different, don't they? Yes. The objection is overruled. I, th I think you answered. Did you answer? You may answer if you didn't. Yes. And just to be more specific, um, the taser is yellow, right? Yes. The firearm is black, correct? Yes. Um, the taser weighs about half as much as your loaded Glock, right? I don't know. Doesn't weigh the same, correct? That's what they testified to earlier, but I don't know. When it comes to the Taser 7 that you had just uh, been recertified on or certified to use, your department used long-range cartridges for that Taser 7, correct? I don't know. You were trained to use it, correct? I don't know now. I don't remember. You don't remember being trained to use the Taser 7 at all? No, I remember being trained, but I don't remember today what cartridges we were issued. Okay. So you went out on the street with a Taser not knowing what that Taser did? I would assume that on the day I worked I would know, but I don't know. It's been months now. Okay. No reason to dispute that the Brooklyn Center Police Department used long-range cartridges in the Taser 7, correct? No. And the reason to do that would be so that you could fire it farther distance with your taser and you wouldn't need to approach someone up close, correct? I would, I don't know, I would assume so, but I don't, I'm not positive. Well, that's why someone would use a long range cartridge as opposed to a short range cartridge, correct? Yes. Okay. And you've been trained on taser since 2002, correct? Yes. You know how they work, right? Mm -hmm. And you know yes. what they do. Can we take those down, please, and put up Exhibit 214? Okay, Exhibit 214 that's been admitted is on the screen. Um, is this a picture of your duty belt? Yes. You'd agree that the holsters for your taser and your firearm are different, correct? Yes. And your firearm holster is empty in this picture, right? There's no firearm in it? Correct. Is that this right here? Yes. Um, the taser holster is made of plastic, right? Yes. And you have to push a button, this button right here, and rock it back to, to get it out of, the out of the holster, correct? Yes. And your, your gun holster is made of leather, is that right? Yes. And it has a little snap, is that right? Yeah, yes. And how does that gun come out of that holster? It would rock forward. How do you pull it with your hand out of your holster? It would rock forward and you would pull it up. Okay, and the taser on the other hand, you would rock, you would depress the button, rock it backward and pull it up, correct? Yes. All right, if we could take that down, thank you. Now, you testified that you have never 
deployed your taser or your firearm while on duty out on the street, correct? Not that I recall. I know for sure my firearm. Okay. But you have drawn your taser uh, multiple times while on duty, correct? Several times. And you said that you did that as a way to de-escalate. I believe that was your testimony on direct? Yes. And approximately how many times did you pull your taser but not deploy it while on duty? For de-escalation, maybe a few times. Now, there are a couple times that you uh, pulled your taser and didn't deploy it. One was in... 2013, correct? No reason to dispute that it happened once in 2013, at least? I would guess no, no reason. Uh, there was a situation where one of your colleagues, a former officer, was hanging on the back of a, an individual, um, and you pointed the taser at him, but didn't tase him because you would have tased your fellow officer, is that right? If it's the one I'm thinking, yes. And instead of... She was on his back. And instead of deploying your taser, you called for extra help, correct? Yes, and we probably continued to fight with him. You never deployed your taser then? No. And there was another incident in 2016 um, where someone was not, being, not complying with commands to place them under arrest, right? I don't know what event you're talking about. Well, in this case, there was a, an individual who was struggling, a female individual. Um, she didn't want to get in handcuffs, and then one of the officers took her down to the ground by force, correct? And you pointed your taser but didn't deploy it, right? If that's what the documents say. I don't recall the incident. Okay. But you recall that you have drawn your taser and not fired it in your 26-year career. Yes. All right, I'd like to talk a little bit more about April 11th. So on April 11th, you were serving as an FTO, right? Yes. And you said that you have done that for 10 or 15 years. For many years. It's, I don't remember when I got certified, but it's been many, many years. Okay. And you said that on direct, I believe your testimony was that you had knowledge to impart and that mentorship skills that made you suited for that job, right? Yes. Um, so you were serving as Officer Lucky's FTO on April 11th. How long had you been his FTO? I believe it would be five shifts. It would have started the Monday after Easter Sunday. Okay. But you were essentially in a supervisory position, right, serving as his FTO? Yes, I guided him. It's a big responsibility, true? Yes. You have to be a good example, sort of set the stage for what a good police officer should do in any particular situation, right? Yes. And to do the job of an FTO, you have to be really familiar with policy and training and um, proper uses of force, right? Yes. And you have to make sure that someone else is doing it all right, too, right? Correct. And... You testified that that morning, the morning of, of April 11th, um, you reviewed pursuit policy with Officer Lucky, correct? That afternoon. Okay. Um, but that pursuit policy includes not shooting at the driver occupants of a vehicle, right? A moving vehicle. And you told Officer Lucky, you know, we're not in the city, right? Did you tell Dr. Miller that you told Officer Lucky in reviewing pursuit policy, you used the phrase, we're not in the city? Because we're on Zane Avenue, which is in Brooklyn Park. And why did you say that? To remind him of geographical boundaries. And you were also reminding him of the limitations of the pursuit policy, correct? Uh, what do you mean? That you can't just get into a high-speed car chase or shoot up a car without specific reasons, right? Yes, for a, our pursuit policy limits what we can pursue for. 
And a, a gross misdemeanor warrant doesn't qualify for a, for a vehicle pursuit, right? Not according to our policy. And you had just reviewed that policy with Officer Lucky that day, correct? Yes. So getting to what happened with the stop, uh, you said that there was a turn signal misplacement, perhaps. You saw a, the wrong turn signal. That was the first thing that you saw? Officer Lucky saw it first. Okay, so you didn't see the wrong turn signal. But after that, you saw the air freshener, right? I saw the re expired registration. Well, you had said on direct that you would not have pulled that vehicle over, right? Probably not. And you said that you knew that there had been some delays because of COVID with people getting their tabs up to date, right? Yes. But you also mentioned the air freshener to counsel on direct, didn't you? Yes. But regardless, expired tabs, air freshener, this is the kind of traffic stop that it's pretty routine for you in your 26 years as a cop, right? No traffic stops routine, but it would have been something I would have done several times. I'm sure you've seen lots and lots of cars with air fresheners and expired tabs. True? Yes. And then the decision was made to pull over the car. You mentioned that there was some information that maybe there was some other warrant that you learned about around that time. You didn't discuss any of that with Officer Lucky, did you? <clears throat> He would have had the same warrant hit that I would have heard. None of that was mentioned. None of it was even worth discussing with Officer Lucky at the time he pulled over the car. Fair? I don't remember if we talked about it or not. Okay. But in any case, you pull over the car, and Officer Lucky approaches the driver's side, approaches Mr. Wright, right? Yes. And he came back to the car with a name, date of birth, um, all kinds of information, right? I know a name and a date of birth. Well, Officer Lucky told you that he um, he believed him. He thought that essentially this that, he, that Mr. Wright was telling the truth, right? Yes. And then when Officer Lucky put in all this information into the system, you corrected him. You admonished him. You told him he was doing it wrong, right? I told him better ways to do it, probably. And that's your job as an FTO, right? Yes. To correct him if he messes something up, right? Yes, when there was an opportunity. So you corrected him, and then he re-entered the information, and then you, um, you found out about the warrant, right? Yes. Um, now, there was also a conversation about Officer Lucky co-foring himself, right? Doing what? Code fouring himself. Oh, code fouring, yes. And did you also correct Officer Lucky for doing that? He did it before he ran the driver, and he shouldn't do that. And you told him that, right? Yes. Don't code for yourself before you have all the information, something to that effect, right? Yes. And again, that was your job as the FTO to correct the, whatever he was doing that was wrong, right? Mm. Yes. So... You got this information um, and then made this decision to go arrest Mr. Wright, correct? Yes. And you didn't talk about going out there with guns drawn or anything like that. You didn't talk about using force on the approach or anything like that, right? No. Um, and then Officer Lucky pulled... Uh, or asked Mr. Wright to get out of the car, which he did, right? Yes. And you stood back and watched this happen, correct? I was just a couple feet away. Okay. Um, but you didn't correct the way that that had happened. You didn't tell Officer Lucky to move or to put Mr. Wright somewhere else, right? I wouldn't do that to a rookie in front of a suspect. Okay. But you didn't do it in... Regardless. Didn't happen. No. And then as you approached and got closer, uh, well, was there a moment that you got closer after things didn't quite go the way you had hoped they would go? I got closer before that happened. Okay. And you'd agree that you unsnapped your gun holster as you approached, right? 
No, I wouldn't agree to that. All right, if we could put on the screen exhibit 12, just the still image at 201.20, please. And zoomed in on, yes, the squad car view. Um, you see yourself in that picture? Yes. And you see your right hand on the right side of your duty belt? Yes. And is your right hand on your firearm here? It's blurry, but it's possible. Okay. We can take that down, thank you. All right, so as you approached um, and Mr. Wright got out of the car, was there a moment where it appeared that Mr. Wright was going to flee or attempt to flee? When he started struggling with Officer Lucky. Okay. And ultimately, was Mr. Wright able to get back in the car? Yes. Yeah. You never saw a weapon uh, on Mr. Wright, did you? No. Never saw a gun? No. He never threw a punch, right? No. He never kicked anyone? No. Never said, I'm going to kill you? No. Never said, I'm going to shoot you? No. Never said, there's a gun in the car and I'm coming after you? No. Okay. It's not uncommon in your experience to find someone who has a warrant during a traffic stop, right? It's not uncommon. And you've done hundreds, hundreds of traffic stops in your career, correct? I don't know if hundreds, but yes, I've done plenty of traffic stops. And, and gross misdemeanor offenses are not the same as felony offenses, fair? Correct. They're a different order by the judge. Less crime. serious crimes, correct? All crimes are serious, but yes. Well, in terms of the laws of the state of Minnesota that you're duty-bound to enforce, a gross misdemeanor is a lesser offense than a felony, correct? Yes. And you don't get to shoot someone because they have a gross misdemeanor warrant, correct? Not for... Correct, Your Honor. It depends on the circumstances. Okay, but the, uh, the objection is sustained. As the hearing will be through You also testified about learning about an order for protection, correct? You yes. You said it was a, a temporary uh, one that you saw, correct? I believe it was an ex parte order. And essentially the order that you're describing would limit contact between two people, correct? Yes, in various ways. It doesn't prohibit all contact with all members of the opposite sex, right? Just certain parties that they're not supposed to have contact with. Right. And you'd agree that half the world's population is female, right? I suppose. So just having a female passenger in your car is not in and of it, and by itself a violation of an OFP, correct? It has to be investigated. Sure. And you did not see a need to rush up to the passenger side of the vehicle and um, pull this woman to safety, right? Not at the moment. Okay. Now, there was also some um, conversation, as you saw in the videos that were offered in, in court in this case, a conversation about uh, the Wright brothers. You made a comment about the Wright brothers joking about not the ones that fly, right? Yes. Um, and then any concerns about whether there was some other Wright family in the area? Sergeant Johnson told you, not that family, not this situation, right? I wasn't sure who they were. Okay. But he didn't cause you uh, any greater... He didn't tell you this is the family we should be concerned about. We've got to be worried about this guy, right? No, he didn't say anything like that. Okay. And when you got um, over to that car and Mr. Wright got back into the car, the car was still running, right? It was running that whole time? I don't know if it was on or not. Well, you told Dr. Miller that the car was running, didn't you? I don't remember that. You 
He told Dr. Miller that Wright pulled away and got back into the driver's seat of the car, which was still running. Okay, then I said that. And the entire time this is happening, you're standing behind Officer Lucky, right? At what point? As Mr. Wright is getting back in the car. I came around Officer Lucky's left side to help him. And you indicated that uh, Sergeant Johnson had approached on the passenger side, but he wouldn't have been in front of the door because that would have been unsafe, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put on the screen Exhibit 13, starting at 201.48, just that, uh, if you could just leave it with that time frame, please. Okay, um, Ms. Potter, on the screen we have Exhibit 13 at 201.48. I'm going to um, slowly advance the frames and then pause it periodically. So let's advance uh, just a bit. Okay, stopping right there. At 201.48, uh, do you see yourself here uh, taking a piece of paper in your left hand? Yes. All right, now advancing to 201.49, please. Okay, now stopping at 201.49, do you see that you've transferred that piece of paper to your right hand? It looks like it. Okay, advance a little further, please. Okay, <coughs> would you agree that the piece of paper at 201.49 is in your right hand? I don't know where it is. Is this the piece of paper right here? Let's Yeah, it's a piece of paper. All right, let's advance a couple more frames, please. Okay, stopping right there. Would you agree in this frame of 201.49 that the piece of paper is in your right hand? Yes. All right, and if we could um, play stopping at 201.54, please. <laughs> Um, a few frames, please. At this point, the paper is in your right hand, correct? It appears that way. And then at 201.55, can stop right there, you've just transferred the paper back to your left hand, correct? That's what the video shows. Okay. And then if we could... Um, advance a few more frames, please. To 201.56. A couple more frames, please. Okay, you'd agree at 201.56 the piece of paper is still in your left hand, correct? Yes. Okay, let's advance. Um, Actually, let's play until 202.01, please. Okay, so stopping at 202.01. Um, you have the firearm in your right hand, correct? And you are pointing it directly at... Mr. Wright, correct? Excuse me, do we have a break? Uh, my client is... Okay. Uh, Miss Potter, do you need to a break? Okay. Uh, this is not in the way, so... Okay, uh, members of the jury, we're going to break for lunch, and we'll start up again at 1.30. Okay. Council, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Ms. Potter, before we 
left for the break. We were walking through what happened on April 11th. Uh, you'd agree that for a large part of the interaction at the side of the car with Mr. Wright, you were standing behind Officer Lucky, right? I was next to him at some point. Okay. And you testified on direct that after you saw uh, a scared look in Sergeant Johnson's face, that's why you decided to use the taser? That was your testimony? Yes. But you also told Dr. Miller that <clears throat> you don't know why you decided to use the taser, right? I haven't seen his report. Would it refresh your recollection to see his report? Yes, please. May I approach Ron? You may. Have a chance to look at that, Ms. Potter? Yes. And did you see the portion where it explains when asked by this examiner why she decided to draw her taser, Officer Potter states, I don't have an answer. My brain said grab the taser. Do you recall that? I don't recall it, but it's in his paperwork. So on April 11th, you reached down and drew your weapon, right? Yes. And you said, taser, 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 so Officer Lucky and Sergeant Johnson would disengage, right? Yes. And they did disengage, didn't they? They let go of Dante Wright and stepped back? According to the video. And after you shot, Dante Wright, you said, shit, I just shot him, I grabbed the wrong fucking gun and I shot him, I'm going to go to prison, and I killed a boy. You said all those things, right? I don't remember. If that's what's in the video, that's what you said, right? Yes. And you said that there are a lot of things that you don't remember and that on direct you testified that your memory came back when you saw your husband that day. But didn't you tell Dr. Miller that you remember seeing the gun in your right hand? You said that, right? I don't remember. My interview with him, I was distraught. I wasn't in a good place. <clears throat> After you shot Dante Wright, you didn't behave like someone who had just saved Sergeant Johnson's life, did you? I was very distraught. I, I, I just shot somebody. I've never done that. Well, you never asked Sergeant Johnson if he was okay, right? I don't remember the conversations. You didn't check in on him at all, right? I don't know. Well, you saw the video when Sergeant Johnson fed you the line, that guy was trying to take off with me. You didn't bite, right? You didn't respond to that at all, did you? The video, I was crying. I was in shock. And he was trying to make you feel better, wasn't he? I, the objection is sustained. Well, he didn't remember saying it, right? You heard that testimony? Yes. And you don't remember him saying that, right? No. And you didn't say anything like, thank God I shot that guy and saved your life. You didn't say anything like that, right? The objection is overruled. You didn't say that, right? No. And you didn't ask Sergeant Johnson anything except to call Chuck, right? I don't remember what I asked him. That would be on the video, right? 
Yeah. You'd agree that as a police officer, you have the duty to render aid and communicate information to other officers, right? Yes. And it's part of your job to assist those who are hurt or injured, true? Yes. And to communicate to other officers what you know about a particular scene, right? Yes. Give them whatever information you can to help them do their jobs, to help render assistance, things like that, right? Yes. But you didn't do any of those things on April 11th, did you? No. You stopped doing your job completely. You didn't communicate what happened over the radio, right? No. You didn't make sure any officers knew what you had just done, right? No. You didn't run down the street and try to save Dante Wright's life, did you? No. You didn't check on the other car that had been hit, did you? No. That all happened just down the road from you. You were focused on what you had done, because you had just killed somebody. Right? I'm sorry it happened. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Ms. Potter, from your reaction today, and from your reaction on your video, you didn't plan to use deadly force that day, did you? No. You didn't want to use deadly force, did you? The, the objection is overruled. No! I, no! Because you knew that deadly force was unreasonable and unwarranted in those circumstances. I didn't want to hurt anybody! You didn't want to hurt anybody. And that's why you said, I'm going to go to prison. I don't. <laughs> All right. The objection is sustained. Miss Potter, you know the difference between left and right, don't you? The objection is sustained. It's argumentative. Nothing further, Your Honor. Ms. Potter, no. do, you, do you need a, do you need a break? No. Okay. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Do you remember your visit by Zoom with Dr. Miller, a little bit at least? We had a Zoom interview, yes. Okay, and that was Miller in Florida, correct, that, as far as we know? Yes. And you and me were in my office, correct? Yes. And that was the first time that you had ever seen any of the video, correct? Yes. And were you able to watch it? No. And you did tell Mr. Miller that when Wright pulled away and got back into the driver's seat of the car, which was still running, Potter that you could observe Johnson and Lucky struggling over the console and it appeared that Johnson was trying to prevent Wright from putting the car in drive. Objection leading. The objection is overruled. If you don't remember that, because it was a while ago, I can show it to you to refresh your memory. I don't remember. May I approach, Your Honor? Read to yourself, Ms. Potter, 
the last sentence of the second to the last paragraph. Does that refresh your memory as to what you told them? Yes. And did you tell them that? Pardon me, I didn't hear you. If it's in there, I must have. That day is so blurry. Did you also tell them that you yelled, Taser, 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 so your partners would disengage, disengage from right? Yes. And just a few more questions here. Would it be routine, thinking back when you're a law enforcement officer for 26 years, would it be routine for you to unsnap your holster on the way to a car? No. And why not? I'm only 5'3". If I would get into a fight, I could lose my gun. Did you ever, in your career, shoot your gun at anybody? No. Did you ever shoot your gun in real life during your career? No. And did you ever shoot your taser during your career? It was never deployed. Is that what it means? Yes. And that that would be real life. That would be when you have to use those weapons. That would mean it was an emergency situation, would it not? Well, what would it mean to you? Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Judge. What would that mean to you if you had to shoot your weapon? That I might kill somebody. When you three law enforcement officers, and excuse me, by the way, as far as reporting this shooting, would it be Sergeant Johnson, your boss, would be the one that would be required to do that? Well, well rephrase, rephrase it. Rephrase that. Who would be required, according to policy, to report the shooting? Would it be the shooter or the other person who was in charge there? On that scene, it would have been Sergeant Johnson. Because he was your supervisor, correct? Yes. Then I got a couple more questions. <clears throat> if you stopped a vehicle in Brooklyn Center and you learned that there was a bench warrant for a weapons violation, you learned that there was a temporary restraining order a female had lodged against the person that said he was in the car that, that gave his idea. But he really did Mr. Wright ever give a valid identification for himself? No. And the other office, now you've got no valid information. You've got a gross misdemeanor. You've got a temporary restraining order. you got marijuana smelled by your partner. You got no license, no insurance. Would you let that car go if it if you went up to it and were attempting to handcuff the individual and the car he jumped back in? Would you have thought you should let let him go right down the street? Okay, I'm going to let you. No. On the temporary restraining order, if you learn there is a temporary restraining order, is it protocol? Is it policy to, as soon as you learn that, jump out of the passenger side, run up to the car and ask the lady what her name was? Has that ever been heard of in police practice that you know of? No. Thank you, ma'am. That's all I have to do.
Is there any recross? Ms. Potter, you were asked about some statements that you made to Dr. Miller on redirect, right? Yes. Um, you also told Dr. Miller that you resigned on April 12th to protect your police family, right? Judge, I object to this improper recross examination. I never got into that. I just got into okay. that. Your Honor, the question, the statements to Dr. Yes. Miller are at issue. I'm going to overrule the objection. You may answer that. You told him that, right? Can you repeat the question? You told Dr. Miller that you resigned on April 12th to protect your police family, right? If it's in the report, yes. I haven't seen the report except today. Well, if it's in the report that you also said that they're very important people to you, would that be accurate? Yes. You have a very close relationship with the police officers, other individuals you work with or used to work with at Brooklyn Center, right? Some of them. Sergeant Johnson is a good friend of yours. Judge, I object to this and I'll say the scope. The objection is sustained beyond the scope. You also told Dr. Miller that you don't make mistakes, right? You told him that? If it's in the report, yes. And you told him that you don't want to hurt or injure anybody, right? Right. You mentioned to Dr. Miller your relationship with the individuals that you work with, right? Yes. And that was very important to you, right? Yes. You advocated for their interests in a lot of settings, didn't you, for the people that you worked with? I advocate for everybody. You had a very close relationship with them. You referred to Sergeant Johnson as a rock star, haven't you? I don't know when I would have done that. Nothing further, Your Honor. Go ahead, Mr. Gray. In all of your years there as experience in all of the patrols that you conducted, did you have to rely on your partners for assistance any time you did a stop or an investigation of any nature? Yes. And that would be the family of the police department at Brooklyn Center, correct? Yes. And they were your second family, weren't they? Yes. As far as complaints, in the 26 years that you were a police officer, did you ever have one citizen complaint? Objection, Your Honor, to the scope. The objection is sustained beyond the scope. I have no further questions. Any further comments? No, Your Honor. You may step down. Thank you.